Are you a C-sharp developer who dream to become a full-stack web developer without writing too much JavaScript? ASP.NET Core Blazor is Microsoft's newest application framework that allows you to execute C-sharp codes in the browsers with help from existing mature technologies. All you need to do is to write beautiful C-sharp codes that you always enjoy doing. My name is Frank Liu. I am a senior software developer. I will be your instructor in this complete Blazor course where I will guide you step by step to understand Blazor in depth. This is not just a theoretical course. This is also a hands-on course. You will actually get your hands dirty and work with me to develop a real-world e-commerce web application with clean architecture on both the customer portal and the admin portal. We will start with a simplified implementation of part of the application, and then slowly, we will refactor the code and improve. By the end of the course, you will know every aspect of Blazor in depth, and you will be able to independently build web applications with ASP.NET Core Blazor. You will be able to analyze requirements and design software and you will understand and be able to implement a use case driven and plugin based clean architecture that is highly testable and extremely flexible for future extensions. Feel free to take a look at the course description. I am excited to take this journey with you and I'll see you in the course. The Blazor application framework is based on ASP.NET Core platform. I think it will help us a lot if we spend just about five minutes and understand how ASP.NET Core works. So let's do just that. Blazor is used to create web applications. All web applications process HTTP requests and return HTTP responses. Users send HTTP requests typically from a browser and the corresponding responses contain the information that the users requested. In ASP.NET Core, once the request is routed to the web server, the HTTP request is then encapsulated in the HTTP context object. After that, the context object is passed through one middleware after another. Each middleware takes different responsibilities in processing the request. For example, some middleware take care of loading static resources, some take care of generating dynamic contents, some take care of logging, and some others may take care of error handling. Middleware should be made according to the single responsibility principle. When processing the requests, middleware may write to the HTTP context object for generating the final HTTP response. Since all the middleware is linked together, we call the linked middleware the middleware pipeline. Web developers are responsible to choose what middleware to use in order to solve their particular problems. And they're also responsible for configuring the chosen middleware. In ASP.NET Core, the web server is actually a console application that runs in an infinite loop while listening to your chosen port for HTTP requests. When the console application starts, the first thing it needs to do is to configure the middleware pipeline. ASP.NET Core instantiates the startup class automatically and calls the configure services method to import the middleware packages and their dependencies. And then it automatically calls the configure method for developers to configure the middleware in the middleware pipeline. It might be helpful for understanding the purpose of the two methods. If you imagine the configure services method contains the import statement in JavaScript and the configure method is where you use those JavaScript modules. But officially, the configure services method is where developers do dependency injections in order to plug in the services that the middleware will use for processing the HTTP requests. So you may ask, as an ASP.NET Core web developer, 
Is it true that my job is to create middleware and configure them? Actually, most of the time you work within the framework of a certain set of middleware. Because in ASP.NET Core, above the ASP.NET Core platform, there are three different application frameworks, MVC, Reader Pages, and Blazor. Each framework uses a set of middleware. When creating MVC web applications or web APIs, you work with model classes, Razor views, and controller methods. When creating Razor pages applications, you work with Razor view and their corresponding code behind model classes. When creating Blazor applications, you work with Blazor components, aka Razor components. In the next lecture, let's see how Blazor application framework works while we are creating our first Blazor application. Let's jump into Visual Studio and create our first Blazor application. So this is Visual Studio 2019. The version I have is Visual Studio Community Edition. And this edition is free for anyone to download. So I would suggest you to use Visual Studio as well. So first go to file menu and create a new project. And here we're typing Blazor application, right? I have already displayed here. Click on next and then give it a name. My first Blazor app and then click on create. So Blazor comes with two flavors. First is Blazor server app. So second is Blazor Web Assembly. They are pretty similar, although they work differently. In this course, I am gonna use Blazor Server Application. When you created a Blazor application with Blazor Server App, it's not very difficult to convert it to Blazor Web Assembly later or vice versa. During this course, I'm gonna talk about the differences. For now, let's choose Blazor Server Application with the default settings here and click on create okay so let's quickly take a look at what we have in the project we have a program file which if you have done any c sharp application this looks like a console application but this is a little bit confusing we wanted to create a web application but why it has a main method here which totally looks like a console application okay so the thing is any web application needs to have a web server or, or I can call it a service. Blazor is based on ASP.NET Core and ASP.NET Core is, is using console application to host ASP.NET Core platform and ASP.NET Core platform will in turn host the Blazor application framework. Right? That's why we're seeing the main application. So when we deploy this uh, Blazor application on-prem or on-cloud, this console application runs as a web server, and that web server hosts the ASP.NET Core platform. Right. So this is how we bootstrap uh, Blazor application. The starting point is the main method. And the main method creates the web server, and the web server calls the run method. The run method runs the web server in an infinite loop and it listens to the web request to come in and process the request. When creating the web server, the create host builder method is called. And the create host builder load the startup project by convention and it has two main methods, the configure services and the configure. Like I said in my previous lecture, the configure services is mainly for uh, dependency injections. It injects the uh, components that we want to use in ASP.NET Core as well as in um, Blazor. And the configure method is to configure the ASP.NET Core middleware pipeline. Let's take a look. So under the configure method, we're configuring a few middleware. Basically, anywhere we say use, like use exception handler, use HTS, HSTS, 
use HTTPS redirection, use static files, all of these are middleware. The most important part is here. This is where we configure our Blazor middleware. We're basically saying that map all requests to this host page because Blazor application framework is a framework for a single page application. That's why we're mapping all of the requests to this one single page. Since the HTTP request is routed to the host file, this is entry point of our Blazor application. You can see that this uh, uses a root component, which is the app component, and that is at the root folder. So let's take a look at the app components, which is the root component. It's basically saying that we are running this assembly right which is the assembly that the program that cs file belongs to and we're using this main layout file as the layout and and this actually uh, set up the router configuration once asp.net core platform routes the http request to the host file the router component take care of the rest of the routing tasks we will look at the url and routes our request to corresponding Blazor components. That's that if we found the, the location that the user requests, then we're displaying the main layout component. And if we cannot find it, we also display the main layout component with the, this information in it. Sorry, there's nothing at this address. So let's go inside here and look at what the main layout component looks like. That's inside the shared folder, right? The main layout component actually uses a nav menu component and a body placeholder. And this body placeholder is the key here that all of our pages and components will go inside the body placeholder. And we can see we have all these four pages here under the page folder. There are all Blazor components, and there they will be all displayed under the body placeholder. Let's run our application with Control F5, and let's see what happens. Okay, so this is the default application that inside the Blazor template in Visual Studio, which gives us a sample application. It not only has the Hello World application, but also has this calendar page and this fetch data uh, page that actually uh, has some functionality here. So this calendar page, basically when you click on click me, it increases the current count. The fetch data retrieves data and display it in a grid. All our future component or pages will, go in, will be displayed in here. So we can actually change the layout Right? We can even remove the navigation menu and use whatever components or whatever HTML here. But I want to emphasize that all our future components will be displayed in the body placeholder. The whole point of creating a web application with a application framework like Blazor is to create dynamic content. So let's go ahead and create our first dynamic page. So if I go to Pages folder, right click on it and click on Add and click on New Item and click on Reader Component. Don't select the Reader Page because Reader Page is a completely different application framework within ASP.NET Core. And let's name this as Dynamic Component. Of course, all the component can be Dynamic Component, but let's just name it as Dynamic Component. Click on Add. In order for a component to be routed by using the router component defined in the app component right here, we have to put a page directive, which is add page, and then we can say dynamic, and that's it. So when we run this, I'm doing control F5. If we put slash dynamic which is the page directive routing path 
that we put just now. I'm going to hit enter. You see, this dynamic component title is displayed, which is right here, right? So to prove this, we can say our first dynamic component, and then we go over here and refresh the page, and we can see this. Now, what we want to do is that we want to go to, we want to display a menu item right over here. For that, we want to go to our main layout, and then we see that the menu item is on the left-hand side, right, sidebar. And we go to our nav menu component, and we can see all of the links right here. And in order to display that dynamic page that we just created, we can just copy this. This is the pass that we put in for the page directive. So here we want to put that whatever pass that we give our page. And then this is the name of that. We're going to say dynamic page. And now if we refresh our page, uh, we can see that the dynamic page is right here. So we can navigate to other page, and then navigate back. We can see our dynamic page. So if we go back to our nav menu component right here, which is the sidebar here, we can see this is what we did. We use we use this nav link component, which is a pre-built component in Blazor, and we use this component to navigate to our dynamic page. Right. So this is something we also need to remember: is that whenever in our Blazor application we want to navigate to somewhere on the page, we can use the nav link component. Next. We want to add some dynamic contents on our dynamic page because our dynamic page is actually current, very much static. So what I want to do is I want to add two buttons. According to which button you just clicked on, we want to display different contents on the page. Right here, I want to add two line breaks. And then uh, I want to add the buttons. So I one button and then the button says Blazor Server. And then I have another button that says Blazor Web Assembly. So these are two elements that we're going to use. Next, I want to just, I want to declare two variables. One is for the title that we want to display. The other is the content that we want to display. How we want to display it is that after to another to line breaks, I want to display the title right here. I want to use header h3. And uh, the way I display it is to use reader syntax. So we put at sign here and put title. Uh, this is actually C sharp code. Right? Everything that has at sign it means it's a C sharp code. And this is reader syntax. So after this, I'll display another line break. And then here, I want to display a div. And inside the div, I want to also display the content. So how do we do that? You guessed right. Use add content. And then we are going to handle event handlers in here. And event handlers, uh, we don't want to just play, just use on click because this is going to be JavaScript. So in order to use laser, it has to be add on click. Right? And here, we can handle laser server click over here again at on click and we say handle laser web assembly click and then the squiggly lines is complaining about the method is actually missing so we're gonna just we're gonna declare a method right over here. Uh, and then you will see that right after that, the, the sweepingly line is disappearing, right? It just disappeared. So over here, we're going to copy this name and put it over here. And both of the, the sweepingly line will disappear, right? It disappeared. <clears throat> so here, because we are clicking on the uh, Blazor server button, we want to uh, assign the title, we'll call it Blazor Server, and then content, and the content is this. And for handling the Blazor WebAssembly button click, 
I'm just going to paste that over here. So basically, uh, the content is just saying what Blader server is and what Blader WebAssembly is. And I actually encourage you guys to read what I wrote here. Now we click on the save button and we go to the, we'll go to the page and click on the refresh button. Remember if you do control F5, you actually can do hot reload. You just refresh and you don't have to recompile. Right now, because I did not click on any of the buttons, so you don't see anything here, right? Because the title and the content, the two variables are empty, having empty strings. So as soon as I click on play the server, you can see play the server and, and what it is. And if you click on play the web assembly, it's gonna change the value of those two variables. Again, I can encourage you guys to read what I wrote uh, to understand the differences between the two different flavor of Blazor. But what I'm trying to demonstrate here is actually what I call the trilogy of displaying dynamic content on the UI, which I'm gonna talk about in the next lecture. In the component of any type of single page applications, you have three different things. We have view here, and the view is what the user sees. And we have the state here, which holds the data that needs to be displayed in the view. And we have the events here. This is when user interact with the view and generates the events. The events are handled and the states get updated. When the states get updated, the view also gets updated because the view displays the data inside the state. So this is what I call the trilogy of the component development in single page applications. Our Blazor application is a single page application. So in this lesson, we are going to learn about the three different parts of component development. So let's look at our page component that we just created. So we have our view right here. These HTML markup represent the view of the component. And these two variables, they represent the state of the component. And then these are event handlers. Right. They're handling different kinds of events. We're displaying the data from the state, right? this two state variables, displaying them. And the event handlers mutate the states. And once the states are mutated, the laser application framework automatically update the view. That's why you will see the, the page gets updated when we click on different buttons. So these are the three main aspects of component development in Blazor. And all of our front-end development is around these three aspects. This is the end of section one. We have covered some basic but very important topics about Blazor application development. In the next section, we're going to start implementing our first application. I'll see you in the next section. We have a lot of topics to cover for Blazor applications. In order to fast track or learning process, I wanted to start developing a small part of our application. We are creating a e-commerce website. Any e-commerce website should allow our users to browse our product catalogs. In this first part of our application, we want the user to be able to search our products in our product, product catalog page and be able to see the details of the products that the users are interested in. So we need to have two pages. One is the product catalog page that allows user to search the products. And the other one is the product detail page to display the details of the product. So let's get started with that. The requirement is very clear. So let's actually start with a mockup. So the first page is actually a product catalog search page. So we have a page here and then we have a title here. Below the title, we're gonna have our search box and beside the search box, we have our search button. And on the button, we're gonna say search. And below, we're gonna have a list of products. One thing I wanna emphasize for Blazor applications, and this is actually true for all other single page applications, is that all of the three main aspects that we have talked about, the state, the view, and events are in the same file. 
unlike some other frameworks like model view controllers, MVC framework, you have all those three things in three different places. The models hold the state and the view represents the view and the controller handles those events. So those three things are in three separate places and will help you to enforce the separation of concerns. Here in the front-end frameworks, including Blazor, you have all three things in the same file. So you're going to see the file becomes very big, very quickly, very messy. And that's one of the reasons, main reasons to have component as small as possible. That's why we need to break this screen down into different components. On the top, we're going to have a search component. And here is our product item component. At least we're going to have two components on the screen. Let's go to Visual Studio and start our development. For this course, I'll loosely follow the clean architecture. And in clean architecture, we have two types of business logic. One is application business logic. The other is the domain business logic. And in application business logic, everything starts with use cases. For our search product page, uh, we have search product and view product to use cases. And then in the view product page, we'll currently only have navigate back to search page because the user will just on that page and look at the details of that product. So far, we don't want to add any uh, complicated business logic on this view product page. The only thing the user can do is to navigate back to the search page. So we have two pages and three use cases. There is no domain business logic. The data will just flow from the data source to the data repository objects and then flow into our application business logic objects. Let me clarify what I mean by data repository. A repository class is where I encapsulate all of the data access codes so that I don't have to write those codes in the application logic layer. Basically follows the facade pattern to hide the details of data access. So far, we're not touching Blazor yet because in clean architecture, Blazor will belong to the UI layer. When we develop any applications, no matter what type of applications, it's better to encapsulate the application business logic and domain business logic in a separate layer than the UI so that we, we can have a nice separation of concern. In this first two pages that we're gonna, we're gonna develop, we don't have any domain business logic. So let's get started implementing the three different use cases under our application business logic layer. Although we don't have any core business rules, we do have to implement the core business models, right? In this case, we're dealing with products. So we have to create that. So let's go ahead and create that. Let's reuse the application that we created last time. And we click on this and click on new, add new product. And we're gonna use this first one, the class library with a standard because uh, with a standard, you can use it anywhere. And let's click on next. And this, let's call it eShop. So our application name, and uh, let's call it core business. Like I said, I'm loosely following the clean architecture and I don't want to use uh, like domain business because for anyone who does not know clean architecture very well, they may not know what domain business is. So with core business, uh, people will immediately understand that the core business, business class library contains those core business logic and I just want to uh, give you a very brief overview of what core business logic is. A core business logic exists with or without the existence of the application, right? So it's those business people who follow the business core business rules to carry out the business every day. They can use pen and paper. They can use uh, phone calls. Uh, they do not have to rely on any of the newer technology let alone uh, application that create with computers, right? So the core business rules exist for the businesses. They don't actually 
uh, de depend on the application, right? With or without the existence application, the core business rules are according to the core business rules. So we're going to create this layer to encapsulate that part of the business. In this case, for our search product catalog uh, application, actually, we don't have any core business rules right here. All we have are search and view, and they all belong to the application business logic, right? The application business logic are business logic that exists because of the application, right? So because of the existence of the application, you are able to, to search uh, and you are able to view. So uh, so now let's define a core business, create a core business class library that contains, uh, there's no business logic, but it, there is the domain model, which is the product. So let's delete this class, default class. And let's create two folders. One is the models. The other is the services folder. So the models contains the domain models. And the services folder for now will be empty because we don't have any uh, core business logic. We will have our product class. And I have it in my clipboard and right over here, the product will have ID, brand name, brand name, price, and image link. So we have this and the next we're going to implement the use cases. Okay. We have just implemented our product model in our core business layer, although we don't have any business logic yet. The reason why we implemented the product model first is because our use cases depend on the models. So let's go ahead and create another library to encapsulate the use cases. Again, we're going to use the class library done as standard. We're going to call it eShop.useCases. I don't want to call it application layer because application is from the clean architecture, but use cases is also from clean architecture. But use cases is more intuitive, it's more client facing. Everybody that knows business knows about use cases, whereas application uh, it's less intuitive than use cases. So this is the application business logic layer that encapsulate all of the business logic that exists because of the application. Let's actually delete this as well. We have two screens. Let's call it search product screen because yeah, I want to call it screen because these use cases can be used by any type of project or applications. Though this is a web application, but these use cases can be used by like a mobile application or a watch or any type of IOT devices. So let's call it search product screen. And then we have another one which is going to be a view product screen. And there the search product screen, we have two use cases. I want to use one class for each use case so that when we open the folder, we immediately know how many use cases we're dealing with. And this is also very good for unit testing, although we are not going to do unit testing in this course. In this course, I want to, I don't want to introduce any other frameworks or patterns. Typically I would use the mediator package from JB Bogart. But in this course, I just want to use a very straightforward to represent the use cases so that we can focus more on, so that I can focus on what I want to teach instead of spending too much time on introducing other frameworks. So the search product use case will have just one method, which is going to be the execute and it will return a list of product. For searching, we're going to have a filter and for now we're returning now so that we know it's not implemented. We're going to add a dependency to the core business project, uh, making sure that the dependency is pointing to the right direction. Our use cases points to the core business. Once we add that, we come over here and press on control dot and we import the namespaces and that resolves our dependency problems. Here from the view product, actually let's copy uh, from the search product because they all have the same method is the execute method just return different things in this case it's returning just the product because we want to see the product detail and we do control dot and enter and this resolve the dependency problem too 
Now we have these two methods, the two use cases. How do we implement these two methods? The data actually come from the data store, wherever that data store is. So next, let's think about how we're going to implement the data store. The most tricky part of understanding the clean architecture is to understand the data stores, in my own opinion. Whether it's a database or file system or any I any other I.O. devices. It's easier to understand the dependency direction if you think the use cases layer or the application layer is the core and I.O. devices or data store is a plug. In order, in order for the data store layer to plug in into the use cases, we need to define the interfaces inside the use cases layer, which serves as an abstraction. Let's go ahead and create another folder and let's call it plugin interfaces. Now, we are going to create another subfolder and within here we're going to call it data store we are going to create a bunch of interfaces to represent the abstraction okay we're going to create our first interface for our data store let's call it product repository we are not going to implement the generic repository pattern because that's not necessary i just want to have a very straightforward implementation so Let's change this to public. What we are going to have inside here is search product and we're going to have get product. We are going to have a enumeration of product and let's call it get product. And within here, we're going to have a filter and control dot to use the model. And the other one is just the get product without filter, but with a ID. We are not going to implement the interfaces within the use cases. We're going to do that within the plugin layer. So once we have the interfaces here and the interface represents the abstraction, we can go ahead and implement the use cases with the help of dependency injection. And for that, we we'll come over here and create our dependency injection to inject the data store plugin into our use cases. Although we haven't implemented the data store plugin yet, but that does not matter. That's the advantage of having a plugin based architecture. I assume you know about dependency injection at this moment, uh, but, but don't worry if you don't. I have a full section to talk about dependency injection later in the course. So we use constructor dependency injection and right here within the execute method, we can use product repository and we call the get product to return the enumeration of products. Because we don't have any core business logic here, so we go straight from data store to use cases and then passing through the use cases to the UI. Now we go to our view product use case and we're going to do our dependency injection right here so that we can use the abstraction of our data store and we initialize the private field. Then we can use the private field to get the particular product. And here we need to change the, uh, the parameter so that it passes in the ID and then we feed the ID to the get product method and returns the particular product based on the ID. So at this point, without implementing the data store itself, with the help of the abstraction within the interfaces, we are already able to do our testing. This is uh, the use case is already implemented. Although in this course, I'm not doing any unit testing, maybe in future courses, but I want you to understand that because of the clean architecture and the uh, plugin based uh, architecture, we are able to test it and it's highly testable. And when we're doing our testing, we can mock our data repository by implementing a mock repository. And that is the power of the, this plugin based clean architecture. So that our core business logic, which is the core business logic layer and the application business logic layer, they don't actually depend on the data store. Now let's go ahead and implement our data store. It is very important to understand that database or data stores are I.O. devices. Any I.O. devices should be implemented as plugins. I want to add a description field here. I forgot to add that. So we go to our eShop core business and go to under models folder. So we add the description to the product model. Once we've done that, uh, we need to implement a implementation of the, the plugin, the data store plugin interface, which is the iProduct repository that has two uh, methods. We are going to copy this into our clipboard and then we go ahead and click, uh, go ahead and add a new project 
and that's again is going to be a Donna standard class library. Click on next, and then I'm gonna say e shop dot data store. And for this exercise, I'm gonna provide hard coded data. So I'm gonna just say hard coded. Enco Bob said a good architecture is an architecture that allow you to delay making decisions. So instead of implementing a real data store of any kind, let's make a hard coded data store. And then later we are going to implement a real data store that pulling data from a database or some kind of web service. So for now, let's implement a hard coded data store where we are going to delete this right and then change this because we we had the interface in our clipboard i just pasted it over here and then i'm just going to change this and uh, uh we are going to add a dependency project depend uh, project reference and uh, i'm going to reference the use cases class library because it contains the plugin interface so I click on add and then go over here to control dot and then hit enter to import the using uh, namespace and over here I'm gonna implement this and also implementing this as well and uh, I added a optional parameter just so that if the filter is now or empty then you know we can, we don't have to filter the the product so this one should implement the i product repository repository interface and then we are also doing control dot to implement to import the interfaces namespace uh, let's change this class name the file name to also product repository and import the generic collection namespace as well and now what we need to do is that we need to have we need to initialize the data so because we're going to hard code it so i'm going to initialize data in the constructor so i did i do c tour tap tap so i have this product repository constructor and i am going to declare a private variable we call it product and it's going to be a list of product i'm going to initialize this over here and i have it in my clipboard and you will have it in the github repository so i have all these products where i found the data you know, somewhere online and i'm going to provide that link to the json file that i found online as well it's complaining that it does not implement the interface. So let's go ahead and delete this and then control and say implement interface. All right now it stopped complaining. I think there's something wrong with IntelliSense. Okay, so here we are going to get the product by ID where we're just going to say you know, products dot first or default. I'm going to use link and then and say x dot id equals id all right so i'm going to return this this one over here again we're going to use we're going to use id so we're going to say products dot where uh, x dot name so this one is a little bit we need to add some conditions so if string is null or empty or west base so if the filter has nothing in it, we're just going to return the product. Otherwise, we are going to say, uh, in order to make it case insensitive, I'm gonna do to lower and contains filter to lower as well. So that's our implementation uh, with the hard-coded data. So now that we have our core business use cases and data store layers implemented, let's go ahead and actually test the implementation. All right, so we need to connect our Blazor application with the use cases. When we want to connect that, we have a dependency from our Blazor application to the class in the 
use cases. And uh, the way to implement that dependency injection is to go to startup.cs file and in the configuration, configuration services method, we need to add our dependency. You see, we need to use the classes in the use cases, but our use cases, they don't have interfaces. For dependency injection, we need to implement interfaces. So let's actually implement interfaces for each one of these use cases. Okay, I created these two interfaces. Now we can add the dependencies. And if we look at our search search product, we can see that in our structure, we also added the dependency to the data store plugin interface. So this data store plugin interface is also needs to be register in our dependency injection place. So let's go to the startup.cs and then let's add our dependencies here. So we can add them as transient, which means that every time you require the class, it's gonna be created, right? So a new instance will be created every time. So we um, rely on the product. Okay, so before we do that, actually we need to add the dependencies. Okay, so you can go to add product dependencies. Well, actually, we need to add all of them. I'm going to say product repository. And the implementation of this is product repository. Okay, and then that's it. Basically, what it is is that whenever we need to um, have an implementation of this interface, it's going to create an instance of this class. And the same thing is going to be done to, to the use cases where we have you know, search product, right? the search product use case. And then we also have our uh, view product use case. All right, so now that we've done that, uh, let's go to go ahead and create a new page and let's call it search product, new item, uh, razor component, and let's call this uh, search product. And this is going to be a page component, means that we need to route to this component and this component is going to be used as a page. So we're going to say add page and then say slash product. Remember that uh, a component has three parts, right? The view, the state, and the events. Let's quickly test our use case class libraries by overriding a one of the lifecycle event, which is override on initialize. So provide this, then it will stop complaining. And now what we need to do is to inject our use case inside here. So I'm gonna say inject, I'm gonna say I search product, and then you can see that it's actually pulling all of the namespace here. Right? So in order to do it without namespace. We can go to the imports in Blazor. This is where we import all of the namespace. And once we import here, we can use the any components within the project. We don't have to uh, specifically import the namespace. So as you can see, the script line is gone. So here we can say search product, and um, and then we can get over here and we can say. Uh, search product dot cute and then we can provide a filter but in this case I'm gonna provide nothing and uh, I'm gonna return a list of products and what I'm going to do is I am going to run this run this project right now uh, and set a breakpoint here I need to make sure that everything is returned all right there's no compilation errors just uh, manually type in the URL and then hit enter so let's go to our breakpoint and uh, let's see whether we want to press on F10, whether there's any error. There's no errors. And let's check our products. We have 20 products. So, and that's exactly what we are expecting. All right, so it's working. Now that we know our use cases are working, the data is properly returned and the data store plugin is also working. Now let's go ahead and implement our search products component. Like I mentioned before, we have three different parts within our Blazor component. We have view, we have state and we have event. Let's go ahead and implement a very simple view to see our data. So we are going to have a ordered list, an order list. We need to have a list of items. For that, we need to loop through all of the products. Let's actually first implement our state. We're gonna have a list of products. And products, uh, we can import the namespace here. 
and we save it and we go back. And here, the search product use case return the list of products within the uninitialized method. This is a lifecycle event. So we have our event and we have our state, and we just need to go ahead and implement our view on the top. So first, let's implement a simple view just to test our component. So let's have a, an order list. And we need to have a list of list items in here. And for that, we're going to use razor syntax. Any C sharp code will start with the at sign. So in C sharp, we have for each. So we can use for each here. And we're going to do for each product within the list of products. And within the loop, we need to output the list items. And let's output the name of the product. And again, we need to use at sign here. And let's go ahead and test that. And let's do control F5 without debugging. And we go to our products page by the URL and we see a list of products. And now let's add the search product page into the navigation menu so that we don't have to manually type in the URL. So let's go to our shared folder and then go to navigation menu. And in here, we are going to reuse this dynamic page. The path here is going to be products. Because if we go back to our product component, we can see the page rotting here is product. So that's why we use products here. And it corresponds to the rotting path on the component. So we change to search products. And here we're going to remove the component from the title. And now let's continue implementing our view. Let's uh, add a line break here. And here we're going to have our search box. We are going to have a layout just like this. So we have a div and within here we say search and we're going to have an input element. The type will be text. And then after that, we're going to have a button and text will be search. And let's take a look at the look and view. It doesn't have any functionality yet. Let's refresh the page and see the result. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. Let's add a line break. So actually remember at the beginning, we we're saying that we're going to have a separate component for the search box. So let's go ahead and do that in the next lesson. Now let's extract the search bar to a different component. And again, the reason why we want to do this is because we have all three things, the view, the state, and the events all within the same file. Comparing with something like MVC, the, all three things are separate. This is going to get messy very quickly. So we need to break down a page into different reusable components as small as possible. So let's go ahead and implement this search box. So who knows that in the future, if we need to search something else, then we can reuse this search bar. Let's go to our solution folder and see what have pages. So since we have pages, let's use controls as a terminology. So we have controls, um, which contains the reusable components, right? Over here, we're going to create our new razor component and let's call it search bar. And it's going to have no title. And we, we can copy this into our search bar component as the view. And what we need to implement is the event because when the user click on the search button, we need to filter product catalog. For that, we need to do assign Again, this is going to be uh, C sharp code, so that's why we use assign. So assign on click, and then we're going to say search. Actually, we're going to say handle search, right? And then we go to our code block where we write our C sharp logic, C sharp code here. So in, in here, uh, we're going to say it's going to be a private function. So we use private wait handle search. So we have this event also. We need the data come from the input box. So for that, we also need to implement the state, which is going to be a string. And we are going to say filter, right? So how do we bind this filter to the input box? And this is where the data binding come into play. Here, it's actually pretty easy. We're going to do at, and then we're going to say bind value. And we can put filter directly in here. We don't have to say at sign anymore because we already have the at sign here. 
right? So in order to test the data binding, what we can do is below here, we're going to put our filter directly into view. So, and then let's, uh, without doing any, implement any functionality, let's use this component. So in order to use component, we also need to import the namespace because this is under uh, the controls folder. So we need to go to our imports and we need to import the you know, using my first blazer app dot controls. So that's good enough. And let's go back to our search product component where we can here, we can just say, you know, search bar component. That's it. And let's refresh our screen and see whether everything works. All right. So we still have the search bar, right? And because we implemented the data binding here, and we also put the filter directly on the search bar, let's see if we type what happens. Okay. So nothing happens, right? So what if we step, what if we tap out? Now we can see, right? So it's automatically bound to the filter so it's automatically bound to the filter and that's good and you also notice if you put in you know some other things here and then click on the search button you automatically uh, receive the filter as well so that's good enough and let's go ahead and go back to the search bar component and implement the rest of the logic so what happens is that when user click on the search button this handle search event handler is called but this action need to be passed to the parent component, which is the search product component, because search product component needs to use this action to trigger the filtering. So when the user click on the search button, the handle search event handler is called. And at that moment, we need to pass the filter to the parent component, which is the search product component, because the search product products component need to know what the filter is so that it can use that to filter the product catalog. So in order to do that, we need to declare a public uh, property here. It's not just any public property. It's a, it's something called event callback. And the event callback has a generic type. Here. And this generic type specifies the type of variable that you need to pass to the parent component. So event callback is a way to pass information from a child component to the parent component, right? Because our search bar component is a child component that is used inside the parent component, which is the search products component, right? When we want to pass information from our child component, from the search bar component to the search products component, this is where we want to use event callback and the type of information that we need to pass is it's going to be a string because we want to pass the filter here we can say on search and and this has to be a parameter when we say parameter here then we can use it right over in the parent component we can use it as a kind of an attribute of this element right you can see you can see that on search is right here right? so here then what you need to do is to specify a method that handles this. So we can say handle search, right? And then go down here. We can uh, say private void handle search, but it needs to accept a parameter with the same type that we declared over here. So it's a string. So it needs to be a string here. And what's passed in is actually the filter. Then we go back to our search bar component and we want to invoke this. And event callback parameter is, is different from a delegate in C sharp. So it's different because we don't need to check whether it's null or not. We can just call it directly. So we can just uh, invoke it, right? And we can pass in the, uh, the filter directly because the filter is already bound to the input and that's good enough. And let's give it a test by putting a breakpoint right over here. And then let's run the application. Okay, let's click on search product and going over here. And then we put in something like fit and click on search. Now it's triggered. And if we hover our mouse over here, we can see fit. So our search bar component is working. Next, let's re-implement this products list. So instead of using a simple and ordered list, 
let's go ahead and use a table so let's use table and then uh, we're gonna have and if we go to our core business and look at our model we have brand name name price and image link so we are not going to display the image in the in the table we're not going to display the description but we're going to display brand name and price okay so we are going to go over here and he had and then we're going to say uh, tr and then we're going to say th okay so what we have uh, what we need is a, a name and brand price and then over here we'll have t body and for that we also will need a list of uh, tr instead of putting the tr right in here and do the loop here we want to extract this also as a component and the reason is the same right we need to make the component as small as possible because the reason why we want to implement this as a component is later when we want to implement like add it or uh, delete uh, those functionalities those functionalities don't need to show up in this parent component right so let's go ahead and add another control let's call it product item component again we don't need the title and right here we need to have a tr because this product item component actually we can do this right now instead of having anything else we're gonna loop through it's the same thing as the list we're gonna loop through the product right in products and what we need to do is we need to use the um, product item component inside here we need to provide the current product to it so let's go go back to the product item component and let's implement this so it's going to be a tr in the view and then we have three different tds right uh, but before but, but what is the what is going to be the state first of all we need to implement the state and that's not going to be a, uh, a private it's going to be a public property and uh, it's going to be a product let's just call it product okay and this is not enough if we have this we go back let's see so inside here we cannot see the attribute right there's no product attribute so in order to pass the information we have to declare this as a parameter use uh use attribute right the parameter attribute declares this product property as a parameter so then we can use the parameter to pass in the current product once we have that we go back to over here so now we have the data we are going to display the data over inside here and we're going to use reader syntax so we have product dot name and we can do two string and we're going to do currency so there's a possibility that the product can be null right and with that it's going to throw exception it's going to throw the null reference exception here so to avoid that we need to again use reader syntax i'm going to say if this dot product is not null then we display this in the view and let's go back we have this already here we are going to also add a condition we're going to say if product is our state if product uh, is not now we are displaying a list of product atom component otherwise we're going to display a message and for that we need to have a tr and a td with column span three and we're going to say cannot find product and let's see whether this works or not because we are not filtering and it's still displaying the abc here uh, next let's go ahead and implement the the actual filtering okay let's go ahead and implement the filtering functionality so let's go back to our search product component when we receive the handle search so this handle search is triggered when search button is clicked it's triggered by the event callback so let's implement this so we already have the search product uh, service here right so let's do search product and then we have the execute method and execute method actually can accept a filter right away right so now we can just and that should just work 
and let's see what happens and let's refresh the page so remember the filter is on the name so let's see uh, we have a whole bunch of fit right so let's do fit and click on the search button all right it's working right? and we have you know, bronzer and then we have bronzer okay the filtering is working let's remove this thing where we tested the data binding right so let's go to our uh, search bar component and remove this from here and we also need to test that what if we put in something that doesn't exist right so name product press okay so it's it's not displaying our message so let's fix that the reason why that's not display it's because if we go to our search product component the reason why it's not displaying is because uh, the product is it's not now it's actually an empty uh, list right so we also need to check the count it has to be greater than zero and let's see if we refresh our page what happened okay page loaded let's put in something that doesn't exist still no displaying so what is it complaining okay let's go back and refresh the page test again it cannot find products all right so we implemented our filtering functionality so before we go ahead and implement the view product page let's implement some style so that our search product page looks better so we have this search bar we want to style this first and uh, we have our bootstrap already included in the default template let's take a look at the bootstrap documentation so in here we just type in bootstrap I'll go to bootstrap website and click on documentation uh, here's the version and we go to the latest and uh, we are going to look at uh, because our page you know we have an input box we have a search button it's a type of form go to components go to forms then we'll see things like you know we have input box and then buttons right so we need to find something some example that has horizontal uh, layout right things like this and then with a button so this is a very good example so let's copy let's actually copy this and then go to our code and we just uh, put it over here and we don't need this email thing here so we only need this uh, but it's not going to be very only whatever here so we're going to remove this and this is going to be search right and we're going to put a space here this is not going to be password this is going to be our text uh, actually let's copy this over here we will have this control and let's also give it an id and let's call it filter and this is going to be full corresponds to the filter input and we'll have no placeholder this button will change this text to search actually yeah okay and then we have on click handle search so that's it let's remove this i don't want this button to be a submit button so just implement as a button let's go ahead and refresh our page and see if that works all right so next let's style the the table again let's go to here and let's see so that should be under content and do we have tables yes we have tables so let's just use table let's go to our search product page here we just say class equals table and let's refresh all right very good so it looks much better and if we uh put in something we're filtering it and if we put in something that doesn't exist then yeah looks much better now let's implement our view product page for that we need to create another page component under the pages folder again we're going to choose the razor component and uh, i'm going to say view product all right so we have our view product component created and let's change the name to be product details because this is a page component so the first thing we need to do is to provide a pass and that's going to be product we will navigate to the pass providing an id right so it's going to be like this so this basically says that if the url matches this pattern product slash and id then uh, we are going to 
display this use this component and we can provide a constraint we're saying that the id has to be a integer and in order to get the id all we need to do is to provide a property here and uh, with the same type integer and then uh, we can call it ID. It's not case sensitive and also we also need to have to decorate it with the parameter And so this is what we call a raw parameter. It means that the value of the parameter passing from URL when the user navigate to this page uh, With ID this ID will be available from this parameter. Okay, so now let's implement the state which host the actual product what we need to do is that there is a let's override another see this on parameter set this is a one of the life cycle event in blazor component this is called when the parameter is changed right or when the user navigate to this page then this parameter is given the value and when this parameter is given the value this on parameter set is called so this is a perfect place where we are sure that the parameter will have a value so this is the place we can call our use case layer to get the corresponding product let's inject our view product service and then here we can say view product uh, execute and we need to provide the id just to be safe we can say if id greater than zero then product equals this is good enough so we have the state and we have the event right and now we need to handle the we need to implement the view and for that i have uh, a something in my clipboard so i'm just gonna copy and paste that it's a very simple without styling so we are going to display our um, image so instead of so we're going to change all of them to lowercase product we have our image displayed here and then we have the name of the product we're displaying the brand and we're displaying the price and we're displaying the description and then we're going to go back to our product item component and this is where the item of the component gets mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, repeated repeatedly displayed in the search product component and what we want is that we want to click on the name of the component and navigate to the product detail component right um, the view product component and remember that i mentioned that in order to navigate we have navigation link component let's go ahead and go to our product item component and wrap this name around with the navigation link component so if we go back to the navigation menu we can see that we want to display in here and then uh, the href for href we need to specify the path of that component in here bring us href and then the path of that component which is going to be the view product so it's going to be product slash the id right so that's going to be you know, product. Here we need to use actually a razor syntax to, to get this string. And for that, we're gonna do at sign and then parentheses. So within here, we can write expression. And that's going to be, it's like this, I'm gonna say product slash. And within the interpolation, we can write the ID of the product. Okay, so yeah, it's gonna be ID. So we don't have to write the at sign here. Okay. Let's refresh. Page is loaded. As you can see, the name under the, the name is displayed as a link. And you can see when we hover the mouse over the link at the bottom left corner, we can see the link is uh, it's correctly rendered. Right. So let's see. Let's take a look at the second product. And we have a product image displayed, and we have the name, I mean the brand, the pricing, and the description information, which is really good. And we go back and looking at the second play looking at this one again all of the information is displayed and let's style it a little bit so that it looks uh, much better okay let's again uh, go to our documentation for bootstrap and let's see whether we can find a container so again go under components and let's find a container that we can use and i think cart could be a good one uh, so if you read the description on a card provide a flexible and accessible con content container with multiple variants and options 
So let's see. So we have card title here. Okay, we have subtitles. So that's pretty good. So we can use subtitle for the and then we have the description here, right? That's actually pretty good. So this card text. Um, so let's actually copy this. Go to our component. Go to the view product component, the product name here. And then we are going to have our brand as the subtitle. And the description go right here. And do we have our links? We don't. Uh, I want to have a separators right here. So display a separator. And then we say price, the price right here. Let's actually use a label and let's use inline style here to make it red. Actually, let's use uh, dark red. Okay. After that, so the price should go below. And then we have our image. So let's see how it looks like if we put this image just about the name and if it doesn't look good we can fix that okay that's not too bad uh, i want it to be a little bit wider so let's go ahead and fix this to be 28. Wait, right, cool so let's go to our search component and try something else Okay, so last thing we need to implement is to allow user to click a button to go back to the search product page. And for that, we don't have a use case for that because it's a pure UI. We can just implement a simple link in the view product component. We can just implement that right below this. So we're gonna have a navigation link, just product back to product. All right, so so we can see the back to products here and that's works that works pretty well uh, let's test our filtering functionality yep it still works and go here and back to products so we're adding a line break here refresh okay this is the end of section two we have implemented our search product page and we implemented the filtering everything works perfectly and we implemented uh, product details page as well. We we're able to navigate back to the search product page. So we have covered a little bit about how to work with Blazor components. In the next section, we're gonna go to each feature of our Blazor component, AKA Razor component, and we're gonna cover each feature in depth. So I'll see you in the next section.